33 people and uh, whenever you say we can start um I, i'm ready whenever you people are okay yeah <laughs> Hey. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. because you muted everyone, so I also. You know, uh, so you are on unmute. Uh, I'm okay. And I wanted, uh, 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 Mir. I wanted you. I wanted to introduce Nitesh here. He is the general manager J W Marriott yeah. here in here. So he's a very old friend. So okay. I've known him for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Because I. Yeah. I mean, obviously. You, <laughs> I've known him from his Oberoi days. So. Oh, okay, fair enough. Okay, so we've got thirty-six yeah, participants. Um, we can start actually. Okay, all it's right, sure. Five o'clock. Um, and we'll be recording this session. Yeah. Um, Don't forget this. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. Um. So our guest today needs no introduction. We've all seen him, read him in various capacities as a star journalist, a food critic, and a talk show host. Uh, Veer uh, writes a column, Rude Food, in Hindustan Times Brunch Magazine, which is also a book published by Penguin in 2003. Um, the book has won the Gourmet Award as the best food literature book. Um, he's also been given the Best Food Critic Award from the Indian Culinary Foundation and we are honored to have him with us for the second time um at Hosharpur Literary Society um though again behind the screen and we would really want him to come down to Hosharpur very soon um in conversation with me here we have Mr Kushwan Singh um he's the state information commissioner of Punjab and auth and they'll be much uh, i won't take much of your time and i'm just going to give the mic to kushman and um, here we begin am i audible yes yes hi we yes, in fact in hey kushman how are you very well such a pleasure is yeah. i mean i'm seeing you on the screen again and again but we need to get this going. i know <laughs> well the last time you remember i nearly came to hosharpur and then there was very bad weather and then we couldn't land so we yes. ended up doing it like this so yes. i think that seems to be my destiny with hosharpur that we only seem to have virtual meetings no we shall in fact and we'll ensure that uh, the chief minister's helicopter flies <laughs> on <cut. laughs> <laughs> which didn't happen last the last time, time. Yeah. and before i start this conversation uh, uh, sanai if you would also mention the book uh, his veer's latest book uh, i'll yeah. mention it i'll mention it it's easy enough yes. it's the first one which he mentioned which got the gourmet award was called root food it was a collection of root food columns a second collection was published last year by penguin called oddly enough not more root food which is what i wanted them to call it but the indian pantry and that's in the bookshops now the gourmet award for this year has not yet been announced but the book is nominated for that as well and it won the a version of the gourmet award for best food literature book in india which frankly is not saying a lot but hopefully we'll get somewhere on the international list as well Thank you sir. Thank you. And just to begin my little introduction about we in the sense you know that he's not merely just a food critic I mean the amount of literature that we's uh, created I think I think that's um, that's monumental around food when he started working in 1979 and in fact there was a time I was reading and as part of your introduction in rude food that you actually had a pseudonym uh, as Vikram Sinha correct for three four years you wrote a food yeah. column and uh, basically that was to kind of beat the entire corruption and the whole free loading uh, food yeah. critic system you know and you started with this uh so how do we start i'm going to start about uh, you know how much ever we are talking about food and whatever you've written about food it's all been in good times um great times food industry blooming but 
uh, suddenly we are in these times when uh, you know hunger around us is really really um, uh, kind of staring us at our face especially with the migrant issue uh, i just want to start with actually on that note that when you write your column do you reflect differently right now in the times that we are in it's an interesting question kushwant because when the lockdown started and i saw pictures of migrants on social media not on television because television had blacked them out a certain guilt struck me could you really write about good food when there were people out there on the streets you know people who had been uprooted they were carrying all of their possessions in one little cloth portly or one paper bag and we could i write about nice wine nice food and i decided that in all conscience i couldn't so for at least 6 weeks i didn't do any food type columns i did columns on the future of the restaurant industry i read columns on what you could do within the within your homes during the lockdown i read general columns about hotels and then i have two columns i have a column called the taste which is on hindustantimes.com and root food which you referred to which is in brunch so that's what i did in brunch and the taste i turned into a sort of political current affairs column and stopped writing about food but this went on for like 6 weeks and i had imagined as i imagined had us all that in 6 weeks the lockdown would be over the migrants would have been rescued sent home given something sadly the problem continues but after about 6 weeks because i got so many protests from people i said okay i will take into account the special circumstances we are in but at the end of the day you and i do have to eat so it's foolish to pretend that out of sympathy for the migrants we are starving ourselves so i've resumed writing about food but you're absolutely right it was a difficult decision and for a long time i didn't do it right this takes me to the second question you know the other extreme of the lockdown period i ever see you know mankind has cooked and experimented so much with food at home uh especially baking or loafing as i call it uh, yeah. so i'm sure you also must have indulged in it you know even actors like diljit dosanjh are on it you know and the chef is the new hero on insta for everyone uh but do you think this cooking and tasting by families will trigger a sort of a renaissance in food in the sense a major shift is happening as we look at food its recipes uh it has made this healthier taste t- taste wise it's better and obviously light on the wallet yeah i mean i have sort of several views on this the first is that one of the most distressing things about development and perhaps an inevitable consequence of it is that people had stopped cooking we went out or when we ate food at home we ate simple convenience food we didn't really care great dishes of our own cuisines were being lost they were passed on from mother to daughter or father to son and basically sons and daughters really weren't interested or said that they didn't have the time to cook so they stopped bothering so that used to worry me i'm glad now that so many more people are cooking people are calling up their mothers they're looking for recipes they're going on the internet and saying i remember this dish is there a recipe for it so you're absolutely right there is a renaissance in cooking people are spending more time in the kitchen than ever before and i think that's a good thing the second second part of this is that a lot of restaurants get by on impressing you with dishes which they think are so exotic that you couldn't possibly understand how difficult it is to make them actually they're not so difficult and because people have had this time they've gone on the internet they've seen the recipes they've seen demos and they're trying them so a lot of the mystique and a word i don't really like but the sort of difficulty that surrounds difficult dishes the intimidating nature is gone they are now dishes that people mm-hmm. understand that they make themselves and i think that's a good thing so i think overall i'm just so happy that people are spending more time in kitchens yeah exactly i think everyone's now a baker has a baker in the house i mean i don't think so a lot of people will be going to buy bread and <laughs> in the sense that yeah So my wife is baking falafels tonight so we shall find out on the subject of baking <laughs> yeah. so this leads me to the next question um uh, 
you know that do you think that the, these hidden talents i mean obviously the hidden talents would have been discovered and you know a lot of people would have discovered their culinary skills and all that and do you think this this hobby is now this will turn into an entrepreneur soon and we'll see a new surge of uh, you know food places cafes and and what would you what would be your advice to them i mean if if such a thing were to happen i hope so but you know kushwan the problem is that if say you and i wanted to open a cafe in say delhi first now i suppose it may change but it's difficult first of all to find the real estate then once you found the real estate the guy will ask for money in black which you and I don't have so it will be difficult to even do that deal once you've done that deal you have to go to the excise department there the guy will ask for money then the cop who comes to check your place out will ask for money the sho will say you have to pay me every month because the police station survives on money from people like you so you and i ultimately will be at a loss when it comes to running any kind of operation in the indian environment Fortunately there's a new way out. One of the things I've done over the last few months actually even before this lockdown is encourage people who are cooking and want to sell their food to get to me on Instagram or on WhatsApp and I get like literally hundreds of people every month writing to me and often I try their food and these are housewives, home entrepreneurs, guys who quit their jobs because they don't want to do it who doing interesting things and the idea is that because delivery is now become such a big thing they can cook the food and they can send it out to your homes it's about 1/4 of the price of say a five star hotel or even less maybe and it's often as good if not better so the advantage now because of delivery is that these people who practice cooking now have an outlet a way to sell their food and for us a way of getting very good food at home without paying restaurant prices but since you talk about restaurants what is the future of restaurants in the sense that what will survive what will fade away what will emerge um, how to resurrect this industry i mean exact i mean what do you think is the future for the restaurants i mean it's 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 a, it's a difficult question because if you take the present right the current situation restaurants are closed many restaurants are losing crows it's very difficult for some of them are paying their staff some of them have just shut down and said we'll reopen when we re- reopen and we won't pay rent we won't pay salaries we won't do anything but the people who are conscientious and who have been paying staff have been paying salaries are now in deep holes because there's outgoings there's no money coming in it will be difficult for them to recover this number one number two when restaurants do open and i hope that sooner rather than later if you're going to impose social distancing norms and you're going to say 6 feet or 2 meters or whatever that means you're going to reduce the number of people a restaurant can serve by 2 thirds so they're going to get 1/3 of the customers they used to get which means their revenues are reduced they'll have to sack cooks they'll have to sack waiters you don't need so many people can they run those restaurants pay those rents with just one third of the old revenues we don't know there's a movement in europe boris johnson in england is just okayed to say that 6 feet is too much italy they've opened with 1 meter social distancing that might work there are innovative solutions in london there's an area called soho which is a restaurant hub the soho restaurant is association has said that for the few months following the british lockdown make the streets around the restaurants and they are quite small streets make them pedestrian streets and we'll take over those streets put tables over there and we'll therefore be able to get over this terrible social distancing regulation i think the british government will agree now if you do things like that restaurants may make revenues in india unfortunately the problem is that the government acts like the restaurant industry does not exist the restaurant industry is very ineptly run at an association level so its lobbying is as good as not there it's largely worthless and worst of all there doesn't seem to be the kind of support for the restaurant industry in india 
that there is say in Italy or England or whatever, people seem bizarrely quite content to let the restaurant industry die. It's a very sad situation for the restaurant industry. So in the medium term, the only hope really is that the vaccines that we've been talking about and Dr. Fauci, who's President Trump's advisor, said he reckoned by January of a vaccine would be widely available. Other people have said even earlier, once we get a vaccine and we're all vaccinated, then it's pretty much back to normal. And so the restaurants who can make it till the beginning of the next year, I think you're okay. I think life will return to what it used to be before the lockdown. The problem is staying afloat till then. So, I mean, just a question that came to my mind as you were talking that there are no lobbies and, you know, like the Western world. And so I think, do you think there's a, there's, there's a disconnect between the farmer and the restaurant, you know? Um, I think I think globally I've seen that restaurants recognize the role of the farmer in bring, bringing food on a plate. And there is this whole farmer lobby that also understands that how the food should be consumed. But here, actually, when someone is on a restaurant, they even don't realize that the food has actually come. Everything there has come from some farm. I, I, I couldn't have put it better myself. Essentially, restaurants are what? They're a way of taking the farmer's produce and getting it to people. Right? But when you listen to restauranters, even to chefs, though that's changing now, fortunately, they have no concept of where the food has come from. They have no concept when you're dealing with animals of where the animal has come from. They think that everything comes to them from the purchase department in nice little packets and they make the food. I'll give you examples. Like we eat goat in India, right? When you say mutton in India, it means goat. Though Indian restaurant executives are very scared of saying goat. So a dish will always be described as lamb on the menu, even though you and I know it's goat. But let's take goat as an example. Indian doctors will tell you, don't eat mutton. It's really very unhealthy. Eat chicken. These are things they've learned from American textbooks and they refer to beef. The reality is that goat, which is what you and I eat, is an extremely healthy meat. It's a meat that has a lower fat content than chicken. Chefs don't know this. They pay no attention to where the goat comes from. The goat is now a very trendy animal in America. And if you go to a restaurant that serves goat, you will be told which farm it came from. You will be told the age of the goat. You will be told the breed of the goat. I would be surprised if you could show me 10 chefs in India who know the breed of the goat they're serving. We just don't care. When you ask them about the rice and you ask what kind of rice is it, where was it grown, they have no clue. There's one of the failures in the way we teach catering in this country has been the complete disconnect between the product, the man who creates that product and the chef. Exactly. And I think I think that effort needs to be there. I mean, uh, I realize that, in fact. Uh, so I'll, I'll come to the, my next um, question, you know. Um, in fact, that is what something I discussed with Nitesh also, that there seems to be this, you know, mass uh, and mass pink slips are being given to, you know, uh, people in the hotel industry. And, uh, and also... It's something like, you know, the, the people are losing faith in the hotel interest industry. It's very, very HRD. It's, you know, the people that come and work for it. And also the students, the students, thousands of students who are in the catering, you know, institutes, uh, some are interning and suddenly they see this very dark future, um, you know, with the hotel industry and the restaurant industry just kind of coming to a standstill. What, what sort of a future do you, do you uh, okay. see okay. for them? A few things. The first is compared to the standalone restaurant industry, the hotel industry is in a much better place. Its, prop, its organizations and associations are properly led. They know how to lobby the government. They seem to have a connect with their customers. All hotels survive on customer loyalty. Indian restaurants don't give a damn about customer loyalty and are now paying the price for it. Many chains, and Nitesh is here, so I'll give you the example of Marriott, are very, very people obsessed, which is the chain he works with. They do their hardest to make sure that even if people take temporary pain, they take a pay cut, they try and sack 
as few people as possible. Now, the hotel industry is a slightly complicated structure, so it's not that easy in that even in a hotel that, say, Marriott runs, Marriott doesn't own the hotel. There's an owner there who owns the property. The owner is making losses. He's keen to cut his losses. He doesn't see why he should pay salaries for people. So the challenge before the international change, the Hyatt's and the Marriott's, is can you get your owners to agree to look after your people? It's not always possible, but I'm pleased to say in the case of Marriott and Hyatt, they seem to have managed to do that. As for the longer term thing, whether people in catering colleges should be depressed, I frankly don't think so. Hotels will reopen, I reckon, within a week. The government already has a proposal to reopen hotels. They won't reopen hotel restaurants because that will lead to similar demands from standalone restaurants. But once hotels start reopening and travel will take time. But again, I believe that by the beginning of the next year, after the vaccine and the drugs have been found, the hotel industry will be back to full strength. I'm not being overly optimistic. Nitish will tell you this. The Marriott hotels in China and in Wuhan which was ground zero for this epidemic, are now running and they're doing 40% occupancy. They'll go up in season to 18, 90% occupancy. So hotels have bounced back before and they'll do it again. Okay, now I'm coming to your, uh, to your book, uh, Veer. Okay. And I have gone through the book. I mean, it's, it's such a fascinating book. And uh, I must say that I loved reading it and the contempt with which you treat high pricing snobbery and corruption in food journalism is absolutely brutal, you know, <laughs> it's fun, though you use the word a crap a lot. I mean, in a food book, yeah. that's, that's a word which yeah, my wife keeps my wife now edits all of my copy and she keeps going through it and striking out all the craps and saying, craps, don't yeah. you know, don't you know any other words? Why do you keep saying so much crap? So I think you have a valid point. There. So, but so I've kind of culled out part which are more relevant to the region, to Punjab. So I'm going, yeah. this is my main question, the star question okay. of the evening, you know. Uh, but before that, why is it called rude food? Oh, it's a very silly name. I think the story is in the introduction. We yeah. were revamping the Hindustan Times Sunday supplement when I was the editor. We're talking about what, now, what, 2001, nearly 20 years ago. And I thought food would become very big, a just judgment that I think I've been vindicated on. And I said, you've got to have a food column. And we kept looking for someone to do a food column and we couldn't find anyone. So they said in the dummy, which was the proposed thing, which we had to take to the publisher, why don't you write a column and then we'll see. So I wrote it. And because I was the editor and it was felt at that time, not by me, but by the paper that the editor of the Hindustan Times should write political editorials and should not be writing about food. And I had a political column anyway. We used a pseudonym called, I think, Grof Fromage. And ultimately, by the time we were ready to launch the publication, we hadn't found anyone to do the column. So they said, stick with it, do it call it Grof Fromage. And I reluctantly agreed. And then we had to find a name. And most food columns at that stage were these sort of chamcha columns that took whatever any restaurant PR told you and wrote it down. And I said, let's call it rude food. It's a silly name, but it will suggest that we are not bowed down by restaurant PRs or whatever. And we are honest in our opinions. So in retrospect, the column is not particularly rude any longer. It's so it's a bit it, of a you, silly name, but you're you stuck with it. You picked it up from a from a dirty magazine. Uh, from a side, yeah, there was a book actually. Since <laughs> okay. you want me to, I was saying family audience, I won't tell the story. But yeah, there was a picture book called Rude Food, which used body parts to simulate things like food containers. I cannot go into greater detail. And it seemed like a nice rhyming name. So we took it from that book. Fair enough. And now this is my star question since okay. we are in Punjab and uh, this, that how did the dead chicken get into the, the tandoor? In fact, I'm going to read an excerpt, a small excerpt from your chapter, yeah. which says the out of tandoori chicken. Yeah. It just says long before the, tandoor. so there are two little excerpts actually. Okay. One is, one is, uh, for instance, Here's surprise number one. Unlike the bulk of North Indian vegetarian cuisine, tandoori chicken has a Hindu rather than Muslim origin. Yes. Surprise number two, it was actually invented by Punjabis. So this yes. is tandoor. And 
Long before the tandoor became home of the dead chicken, Punjabis installed tandoors in the courtyards of their homes to bake rotis. The history of the tandoori roti is well documented. What is not clear is when did some bright spark decide to put a whole chicken into the tandoor? This was 2003. I have since found who the bright spark was and what happened. As you know, Punjabis have always used the tandoor to make rotis later for naans and in places like Amritsar with on very low heat for kulchas. There was a restaurant called, oddly enough, Moti Mahal in Peshawar in the 1930s. It was owned by Sardar Mukha Singh. And Sardar Mukha Singh had the bright idea of putting chicken in the tandoor. His argument was that it was easy to do. You could put two chickens, three chickens on a skewer, put them in and you would have enough food to feed half the restaurant in no time at all. The restaurant became popular in Peshawar and I think a few other people copied it. Then around 1947 and with the big partition problem, Mukha Singh came across along with the all other refugees or migrants, or whatever you want to call them. So did various people who'd worked at his restaurant. One of them was a man called Kundanlal Jaggi and the other also called Kundanlal, confusingly, was Kundanlal Gujral. They spoke to Mukha Singh and said, why don't we start Moti Mahal in Delhi. Mukha Singh said, I'm not interested. You can keep the name. So they started Moti Mahal in Delhi at a different location and then it moved to the Daryaganj location, which has now become popular. They started serving tandoori chicken, which nobody had ever heard of before. It became an immediate rage. Pandit Nehru discovered them, started bringing Khrushchev and other fo- foreign state guests, you know, five-star hotels as such in those days. So this became the place to go to. Bit by bit, they invented the whole menu. They were stuck at the end of the day, often with bits of tandoori chicken that they didn't know what to do with. So they started taking the chickens apart, putting them in a tomato and butter gravy, which had the effect of rehydrating them because it was a dry chicken. Once you put it in a wet gravy, it became edible again. That was the invention of butter chicken. Then they took Punjabi dal. You're a Punjabi, you will know that your grandfather would never have made dal or grandmother never have made dal with so much tomato and all of that. They decided to take the same sauce, that butter chicken sauce, and put it into Punjabi black dal, into maki dal, and created what is now called Dal Bukhara or whatever fancy name you want, which is now served all over Punjab. So not necessarily in Amritsar, places like Kesar Dadaba will still serve you the real thing. So they created a whole school of North Indian cooking. Most people don't realize that this is a cuisine that originated on that side of the border in pre-partition, but basically was created by Punjabis in Delhi and in Punjab in the 1950s. So if you go to any Indian restaurant anywhere in the world, the food essentially is Punjabi. Okay, so they're not the Mughlai or that. What no, no. It's the Mughlai stuff people will now do and talk about other than Lucknow. But if you look at the original restauranters all over India, all the restaurants were run by Punjabis, usually Hindus who'd come over after 1947. These are people who started with nothing. So Tandoor they is created also a whole things. industry. Rai Bahadur Mohan Singh Obroy was a Punjabi. The food he served at his hotels essentially was Punjabi. So that became the standard. So the Indian hotel industry and the Indian restaurant industry are actually Punjab's great contribution to Indian cuisine. Right. So in fact, Tandoor, you also write, is not a very old thing. I mean, it's we'd be associated with Afghanistan and all, which it is not. That's interesting because we, you have it in Afghanistan, you have it in many Middle Eastern countries. Sometimes it's a different shape. It's called a tandil, a tandul, various things. But now excavations at Indus Valley sites have found clay ovens suggesting that we we were using an early version of the tandul in 2000 BC. We know, I mean, the two interesting things about the Indus Valley is we know it's universally established that the chicken, which was a wild animal, was domesticated for the first time in the Indus Valley. Until then, it was never farmed or cultivated. So the Indus Valley gave us harappa, gave us the tandoor, it gave us the chicken. They had very strong links with 
Mesopotamia or Iraq as we'd call it now. There were trade links. The chances are the chicken went from here to the Middle East and from the Middle East to Europe. And so did the tandoor. So maybe tandoori chicken is a forgotten dish which is 5,000 years old. Who knows? Okay, now I come to the next question which is actually again your chapter on what you call uh, the Sino Ludhiana. Another great Punjabi invention. I mean, we call it the Indian Chinese, but I'm surprised. I mean, it's just known for chavla chicken and how the Indian Chinese is actually the Sino. In fact, there's this very interesting excerpt also, if you allow me to read just two yeah. lines from it. Uh, Though the dragon had opened four years before the house of Ming, it was the latter restaurant that changed the way we eat Chinese food. Punjabis who had till then stuck to ordering butter chicken and saag paneer at restaurants, suddenly realized that there was now an alternative you could eat, masalidhar Chinese food. Correct. Yeah, this Absolutely is true. Absolutely true. The food, Chinese food in India was made traditionally by the Chinese community in Calcutta. They are, the Chinese in Calcutta are Hakka, which is a sort of gypsy kind of Chinese person who travels everywhere. The Hakka Chinese didn't serve their own food. They served a sort of Cantonese American menu. It was interesting, but there was no big boom. In 1974, the Taj, the Taj group discovered Masaledar Sichuan cuisine, but it was Masaledar in a very different way from our masalas, opened the Golden Dragon in Bombay. It was a great success. Other Chinese restaurants, remember that most of India's Chinese restaurateurs at that stage, the furthest east they had ever been themselves was Chaurangi. They were all second or third rate, third generation Chinese. So they really had no idea what Chinese food really was like. They started copying the Sichuan food. And the story is, so he claims that it's been denied by many people. So I'm not getting into that. It's a man called Nelson Wang, who worked in a restaurant called Frederick's behind the Taj, invented chicken Manchurian because he didn't know what a Sichuan pepper was. He didn't know what authentic Sichuan spices were. He used Indian masalas. 1978, the Taj opened House of Ming in Delhi. The moment they opened the House of Ming in Delhi, Punjabis realized that you could have spicy Chinese food. All the local restaurateurs took those dishes. They took Nelson's chicken Manchurian and this red sauce masaladar Chinese that we associate with every restaurant was invented there. Again, largely by Punjabi restaurateurs. It's a bit unfair to give the credit to Ludhiana. I just made up the name because it seemed like a Punjabi name. And when I went to Ludhiana five years ago, I was greeted by various people who said, welcome to the home of Punjabi Chinese. But I mean, it isn't really the home of Punjabi Chinese. It was invented in Delhi. All right. And before I get on to the whiskey and wine, and mm. um, let me ask you this, uh, you know, to demystify this, the sweet tr truth about chocolate. Um, uh -huh. Rather, you broke my heart when you write that five star was hardly a chocolate. I mean, what was I sending to girls in schools? <laughs> as long as it worked, why should you bar. care? <laughs> it was a wheat bar, more than a chocolate. <laughs> yeah. See, chocolate is not an Indian thing. Chocolate was brought to India by the British. Cadbury, which was one of the first and for a long time the only real chocolate company of consequence, tried planting chocolate beans in India and it took a long time to get, the, get it right. In the 60s and the 70s, as global prices of chocolate, of the cocoa bean, went through the roof. They had to invent so-called chocolates that had no real chocolate content. So hence, all these uh, five stars, which was, five star was basically a ripoff of the Mars bar. It wasn't as good as the Mars bar, but that's what they were trying at low cost. And all the other things, there used to be one with a wafer inside. I've forgotten all their names. All the Indian chocolates of that era had one guiding principle, try and put as little chocolate as possible. Okay. And, and there are these four other interesting nuggets in your book, and maybe you can just demystify the entire, the four of them. Yeah. briefly, I mean, it's as you please. Uh, Somebody called Bunny has just responded, yeah. Crisp is the chocolate name I was thinking for. Thank you, Bunny. Go on, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> go, 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 go. Yeah. It's like, it's the relationship, you know, you talk about Maida. In fact, it's interesting. You say, you write that in Bengal, everyone, no one even knows about Atta, whereas in Punjab, it's all about Atta. Yeah. You know, there's 
and uh, but the relationship of maida and the tandoori roti then you are very then the scandal of the brown bread the scam of the mineral water yeah and the mystery of the olive oil so i just club these three four things together so which one do you want to start with you start with i think punjabis would love the demystifying of the tandoori roti and maida maybe but you know maida is refined wheat flour it's not an essential indian ingredient the first accounts we find of maida in india are about delhi sultanate pre mughal period it came from the middle east indians had no tradition of baking even to this day most bakeries in india are not run by hindus it's a big muslim thing and now parsi is in places like bombay because they understood ovens and they understood baking because of a middle eastern tradition that we never had so maida came with them and maida has many other uses it seems more sophisticated you can do more with it the taste many people prefer so maida maida was gratefully embraced by people in india a tandoori roti should be made with atta but people started making it with maida the naan is not 100% indian in origin it comes from the middle east if you look at one of its essential ingredients which is that most naans made everywhere have egg in them no indian dish ever had egg i mean they go to great lengths to hide this from their customers but if you're a pure vegetarian and you go to a restaurant and order a naan the chances are you eating egg because they all put egg into it so it's not a traditional through the centuries kind of indian dish bengal bizarrely which is basically rice country has no great tradition of rotis or parathas or anything from the old days embraced maida as being sophisticated so the luchis the bengali puris they will make from maida i have never understood why but bengalis love maida now of course maida is the norm because everybody is baking and it's difficult to bake with whole wheat flour or with atta restaurants i mean it's it's much more difficult to make good bread with atta than it is with maida so as i've written in the book what they started doing is making the exact same maida toast or whatever they would earlier but they would caramelize sugar and put it in to change the color and they started selling it as whole wheat bread or brown bread i'm told that this doesn't happen so often but i'm not so sure so i think I that think it still happens the the part about the brown bread also you 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 speak about yeah the brown bread is basically now i mean hotels all yes. show me they've changed but it was just basically white bread that was colored the mineral water scam i think has now been globally exposed which is that mineral water is a huge profit center from hotels for hotels they buy it cheap and then they sell it at huge markups to guests in the old days they would ask you do you want ordinary water or do you want mineral water now often they just give you mineral water and if you look like a rich and foolish man they'll give you foreign or imported mineral water and they'll charge you for it and they'll make a lot of money out of it so i've said in the book that whenever anybody at a hotel gives me mineral water and charges me without having asked me i strike out the item from the bill and refuse to pay if they come to me and they say will you have normal water or will you have mineral water i always say is your normal water safe and no hotels going to say no our water is dangerous so they always admit that the water is quite safe and then they don't come back with mineral water all right and now I, this is a personal question actually and uh, i hold this against you i <laughs> for for All this right. indian whiskey at least or the scotch that i buy from the indian stores you've kind uh-huh. of really banished that part but it's not whiskey yeah all indian <laughs> liquor all imfl by definition is neutral alcohol to which they add flavoring so the same neutral alcohol will make your whiskey and your gin and your vodka and nearly everything else so i mean there is nothing wrong with liking it with people like all kinds of things but it's a bit uh, dubious to compare it to whiskey made the right way that's why for a long time the only thing that really made sense in india to drink was rum because our neutral alcohol is made from molasses and so is rum which is why indian rum has always been quite good but indian whiskey with great mm-hmm. respect is not really 
anything like the real thing. But you've also said the scotch that we buy, you know, is actually rubbish. It's basically just... It's changing. It's changing. What used to happen in the old days was there was such strong import controls on whiskey that a smuggling sector grew up. It wasn't that easy to smuggle scotch. So they started making it themselves. If you went, when I was growing up, to Kabadiwala in Bombay, and you offered him a bottle of empty bottle of black label, he would give you 10 rupees, which in those days were a lot of money. And what would he do with it? He would sell it to some bootlegger who would then make dubious scotch in some suburb of Bombay and sell it to Bombay's elite who would love it, not realizing how bogus it was. At one stage, it was said that there was more black label drunk in India than was produced in Scotland. But yeah, you've been a great advocate of rum, actually, if you were, one were to yep. buy an Indian drink here in the book. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and a question as we talk about scotch, what is the role of water in scotch making in the sense, I feel that since water is distilled, it's overhyped, but does water play a role? I mean, is Scotland... Damn all, because of damn all, damn all. I did, I'm probably going to get into trouble. I made a film for Glenlivet. And Glenlivet is outstanding malt whiskey, he says quickly. And it's, they go on about the water in Glenlivet, which comes from something called Josie's Well, which is a legendary well from which the water comes. But if you see the way in which they filter and they refine the water, pretty much anything that Josie had added from a well is removed. It's the same as any kind of distilled water, any kind of uh, mineral water, any kind of normal water, any kind of water that's been treated or filtered water. So I think because many scotches seem the same to people, they try to find ways of distinguishing them and water is one easy way of doing it. Exactly, because uh, I've, I've always said and no one's believed me, I said if water is largely distilled in alcohol, yeah. I mean it's the You're spot on. Yes, yes, spot on. Makes no difference. <laughs> no, no difference. Thank you. Yeah. And from whiskey, I come to wine. There's this chapter on wine in your book. Yeah. And you are really harsh. In this was chapter. in 2003. Yeah? The Indian wine oh, industry so has, it come, has, improved. Yeah, so. it has improved. So, well, Indian wine is not as bad as it used to be in those days. But you've come harsh on the, on the entire wine tasting and all that blah that happens with it. Yeah, yeah. the wine snobbery is nauseating. I mean, people who go on and on about how much they can taste in wine usually are frauds and humbugs. You give them any any bogus Indian wine and tell them it's Muta or Otsil, they can't tell the difference. I'm I'm not I believe that all this snobbery has taken the fun out of wine drinking. Wine drinking is about enjoyment, it's about friendship, it's about matching it with the food. It's not about showing up. All right. Uh I skip from food to uh, this chapter in your book where you talk that the airline food, how crap is the airline food? Crap uh, again, that same word. Yeah, yeah that same word. That <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's really is crap, yeah. And uh, obviously, I think a large part of our audiences, they've traveled and they're travelers. And uh, everyone has a story, you know, about uh, Swadni, as someone says, I'll take my prontha still, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't eat on planes. I mean, now I don't know I don't what makes anyone it, will be allowed to eat on planes for a long time. But, but what food, makes it so? Why, why is it so bad? Yeah, it's easy. If you ever been to a flight kitchen, they will make, assuming it's a simple thing like rasa alu, they will make two thousand to three thousand portions at one time. Yeah, to some institutional recipe, it's almost impossible when you're cooking in such massive quantities to make anything with any attention to detail. It's even more, it's a curry, it's possible. But even a simple thing like say a dosa, which they do for breakfast, they will make 5,000 dosas. So each guy will make a dosa in like five seconds or as quickly as he could. So there is no way almost by definition that food could be any good. Then there's the price factor. Restaurants will charge you reasonable amounts, but airlines will pay flight kitchens very little. Therefore, at that price, flight kitchens will try and cut as many corners. It might be Oberoi Fried Kitchen or Taj Fried Kitchen or some fancy name. But the food you get will not be Oberoi food or Taj food. It will be low-cost food made in bulk. Then, after that, as if all of this was not bad enough, they will keep that food in various kinds of packaging. And by the time you eat it, it may have been 24 hours since it was made. And it's reheated ineptly in the galley by staff 
who are just eager to get the damn thing over with, get the service over with. So don't mind burning it, overheating it. So given all of this, if you get good food on an airplane, it's a miracle. Right. And so coming on to bad food, um, you also mentioned at some point that uh, hotels assign the worst chefs to banquets. That's yeah. <laughs> And in fact, I'm reminded of this story by Manjeet Gill. In fact, you refer to him a lot, yeah. call him the doyen of, you know, the Indian. Yeah, he's my guru when it comes to Indian food. Right. And in fact, I remember this story. He says, whenever people come to us for marriage and they say that 500 will turn up and it's a marriage season, I always say it's 750 because the people don't realize that people come to ITC to eat. The final destination yeah. is Moria. Yeah. Otherwise, no one eats. But but you mentioned that the hotels assign the worst chefs to. Well, the Maurya, since you brought it up, is possibly the exception because they know that people come to ITC to eat a certain kind of Indian food. But generally, banquet menus are fixed in advance. You're offered a banquet menu at one price, a bank, banquet menu at another price. If it's a buffet and they are trying to save money, it will be arranged cleverly. Next time you go to a buffet, assuming buffets <laughs> ever come back, is look at the way in which the high food cost items will be put at the end of the buffet, just before the desserts. The cheaper items will be put at the front. Look at the plates. Often they won't be the same plates you get in the restaurant, but smaller plates. The idea will be that being greedy, you will fill your plate with all the cheap rubbish by the time you get to the really expensive items. And so they will save money. So there's a scam in that. There's a scam in Sunday buffets, which is very similar. Why do you suppose every hotel at the beginning puts all these terrible salads which nobody ever eats at every buffet? Because they want you to fill your plate with them because they're low cost. Why do you suppose that every Sunday brunch, they offer you a choice of fried egg, scrambled egg, etc. Why? Because if you're going and paying 2,000 rupees, 3,000 rupees, and you're eating a boiled egg, you're an idiot. No, It's a thing that costs them 2 rupees or 3 rupees. So that's how they work. I agree. I'm glad that I just skipped that salad counter and just yeah. move forward. So as somebody has just commented, go straight for the seafood, enter yeah. the buffet, look for the lobster, go for the prawns and then laugh. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of the questions that's always intrigued me is vis-a-vis, -vis, you were in Amritsar also recently, yeah. that why is it that one city has better food than the other in the sense that is it the food culture, romance, or like Amritsar just says it's water. I mean, I mean, what, what, what is the real deal here? You know, I don't know. I've tried to work it out. I don't think it's water. I think it's much more complicated than that. I've had some bad meals in Amritsar also. Made exactly. So water. Amritsar, I mean, I'm not very fond of Amritsar food, but, but still, but, why we but have Chandigarh, them? Chandigarh, which is not so from you. You live in Chandigarh, live in right? Chandigarh. Or, yeah. Worst food in Punjab. Okay. It's so difficult to have a good meal. <laughs> Ludhiana, the food is wonderful. Amritsar, overall, the standards are very high. So it must be the same cooks who go from place to place. So why is food not so good in one city and so good in another city? I don't know. I've given up trying to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> and I'm also, you know, kind of always had this question that what is authentic food in the sense that um, can a person of a d different origin create food of a different culture or, or, or is, you know, I, I remember at the New York Lit Fest, I was launching my book and uh, Madhur Jafri, I think that's her name. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she was also launching her book and she says, there's nothing as authentic restaurant. The authentic food is actually in the home. Uh, Even that's not true any longer. I but mean, okay. it, but, but, I mean, but look, what is authentic? I mean, let's take this whole business of a culture and only Indians can make Indian food or whatever. If that was true, then 95% of the Italian food you get all over the world is bogus because pizza parlors, all of that, that's Italian. Italian at the moment is the number one cuisine in, in the world and in terms of number of restaurants. And that's mainly because of pizza. Where are you going to find an Italian making pizza? More Americans make pizza than do Italians, let alone anywhere, anywhere else, right? So the difference between, I think, French food, all everybody cooks French food. That's part of the basic training of every chef. I always think the difference between 
a great global cuisine and an ethnic cuisine is that an ethnic cuisine is only made by people from there. A global cuisine, French, Italian, is made by everybody. If you look at Indian restaurants in London now, they're so difficult to get visas that more and more of them are using English cooks, Indian accent, probably the best Indian restaurant in London. The kitchen is more than half Brit. If you look at Crickets, which is a popular Indian restaurant, which I like, it was founded by Brits and the food is cooked by Brits. Thai food in London, places like the Smoking Goat or Kiln, it's locals who make it. When a Thai guy or we make a, we open a French restaurant in India and the chef is an Indian, we don't think it's odd. So why should we think it odd that Brits are cooking Indian food? But is it authentic so this, in the sense, why do we call, I mean, it yeah. might be Indian food. Right. What is authentic? Define authentic. What is authentic? Yeah, How authentic exactly. is butter chicken? It has no 500 years of history. It was invented in the 1950s in Daryagan. So for example, been through so many things. For example, so you example. write, for example, you write in a passage that the North Indians largely go to restaurants to eat food, which is not available in their house. That's right. The yeah. same food. So, so is the food that we cook at home, is that what ultimately comes into this commercial thing and becomes a No, or, because or there are recipe? always in every cuisine great restaurant dishes and home dishes. No Chinese person can make a Peking duck at home, right? Just as none of us really eats tandoori chicken at home. It's the same with the French. The French are the exception. They are people who go to restaurants to eat French food. But they go because there are great complicated dishes that you got. they're not easy to make at home and restaurants are equipped to do it. Yeah, fair enough, because that was a question that's been, you know, always on yeah. my mind. And, you know, I'm, I'm, as we wind up and I, we come to the last two questions, um, there's a, there are a lot of these blogging sites that have come up and there are these yeah. N number of food critics, everyone is just going to a restaurant and writing. Uh, what, according to you, is a good food review in the sense that, and what is good food uh, journalism? What constitutes a good review? I mean, I think basically a critic should remember that his or her loyalty is not to the restaurant, even though they may be hosting him or her, it's to the readers. I think the moment a blogger or a critic loses sight of that, you're in trouble. And secondly, I think it just boils down to experience. If I went to Ethiopia and I reviewed a restaurant in Ethiopia, I would not be in a position to say what is a good dish and what is a bad dish because I don't have a background in their cuisine. Ultimately, the difference between people who talk a lot about food and people who understand it is points of reference. If you've eaten 50 different butter chickens, you know which is the right one or what is wrong with one. If the first place you go to or you've been to four places and you've had butter chickens, are you really in a position to say what is good, what is bad? It's That's why compared to critics, I always trust chefs and restaurateurs. They have the background. They know the judgment. They have the judgment. They know the dishes. But do you have any so regret the, of pushing some nonsensical cuisine? In your like what? columns? <laughs> which one? Tell me which Any, one. Anyone, any, anything which you, which you think. No, 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 no. Nothing. I'm quite careful about not to push it. No, no, not push in terms of a, yeah. a, a deliberate push, but what you backed and because you also, I think uh, your writing shaped the industry in a certain way. No, no, no. Really hardly. Yeah. The, yeah, hardly, they, hardly. Yeah. I was shaped by the industry, but... Uh, no, I think I've avoided all the fads and all the craziness. So I've been actually quite conservative in the stuff I've liked. I have prejudices. I don't particularly like, say, truffle oil or whatever, which is a synthetic oil, which has nothing to do with truffles, which many so-called fancy European chefs use. So I have prejudices, but beyond that, no. Perfect. I'm on the last question. And in fact, yeah. uh, this question um, had, you know, we I, Vikas Khanna and I had discussed this many years ago. And uh, it stayed with me. And uh, so do you feel that food is beyond, you know, calories and, and essential for living? I mean, is it a unifier of people in the sense if yes. you look at the longer yes. concept or an Indian going to an Italian restaurant or an Italian coming to? So is it how do you see it as this one big un unifier of humanity? Look, everybody has to eat, right? If you don't eat, you die. 
So it's the one thing that we all have to do. We all have to work for it. You don't earn a living. You're finished. But food is the one thing that you have to do that can be fun. So if you eat bad food, if you don't enjoy your food, then you're missing out on a great opportunity. Secondly, as you said, food is about joy. It's about sharing. It's about friends getting together. So food, therefore, should be a unifier. It's, that's why I'm so against food snobbery. That's why I think food in langas or in the dhabas or amritsar, etc. is often much better, not just because the food itself is good, but because of the atmosphere, because of the spirit. Because food is not just about nutrition. Nutrition is a given. Food is about joy. All right. Thank you, Veer. Thank you so much. I think we've had a good one-hour session and thank you for taking our time. It's such, it's such a pleasure. Anytime, Krishna. Yes. Thank you. And Sana, over to you. Yes. Uh, I think it was a great session and uh, it just didn't feel like it. we've been talking for about 55 minutes. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of good things. Um, Five-star mineral water, olive oil, uh, whatnot. So, we'll just ask everyone who's attending the session uh, to type in their questions if they have any. Um, we'll be taking relevant questions only. So we have about 10 minutes. Um, so Kushwant sir, would be asking the question. Um, if anyone has a question, please type in the chat window. There um, are a few questions that have come out. Uh, come uh, no, they had, there hasn't been any. I think, uh, okay. okay. Um, so I have two people, three people who want to ask questions. So why don't Can you, you go ahead? Can you type sir? your questions? Uh, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, yeah, question. can you just, Mr. Kapoor, can you type your question? But that was good, Veer. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Vishra. You made it very good. Uh, Mr. Sorry. Harshira Talwalia, you need to type the question. So. Can't we just ask it? No, because uh, then it just... Uh, uh, the hands are raised when you... When you raise your hand, uh, the hand raise comes, right? We'll just keep one moderator for the session. So it will be nice if you can just type the question. Thank you. Okay, so we have there a is, question. Yeah. Kishman, you want to take that? No, no, no. You please take it. I... Okay, there, there are a lot of them suddenly popping up. Okay, so I've got a question from Mr. Kapoor, Mr. RVS Kapoor. Uh, why is HR going down? I mean, why are hotel employees not as warm as what we saw in childhood? Okay. That's, I think, true, not just of hotel employees. I think that's true of restaurant employees also. I think because in the old days, hoteliering and working in restaurants was not a very well-paid job. People who joined restaurants and hotels as, as waiters, servers, cooks, etc., either came from backgrounds where they couldn't get a better job and were very grateful for the job they had. And the second category was people who loved hospitality. Now as hotels, particularly even more than restaurants, have become better paid jobs. And restaurants too are attracting a different kind of person. You want a smart person who speaks English, can talk to guests. That kind of person can leave you and go and join a call center tomorrow, right? So he's not grateful for the job. He acts like he's doing the restaurant the favor. And because there is no great love of hospitality in his heart, that reflects in the way he treats guests. Great. We've got another question, Veer. This is for you. Uh, so what is your favorite cuisine and do you cook often at home? My wife cooks at home. She's a very good cook. I am the world's worst cook, but I'm <laughs> lucky that I have her. And... I have no favorite cuisine. I have no favorite restaurant, no favorite hotel, no favorite cuisine, no favorite city. I just like everything. So I think that's a great thing with the real foodies. Um, it's not like if, if you're a meat eater, you want a dead animal on your plate every night. And if you're a vegetarian, you should not have a prejudice for non-vegetarian. So a real yeah. foodie appreciates good food, um, you know, be it meat or vegetables or exactly. whatever. It has to be good food. Great. So uh, we've got another question. Hi, Veer. Um, how would the bu buffets look like now, especially the morning breakfast at hotels? I think the breakfast buffet at hotels is dead for the foreseeable future. Nobody is going to queue up for the egg counter. Nobody is going to 
eat cold rolls. Nobody is going to stand next to anybody. The hotels that I know are reopening are discussing grab and go breakfasts that you can deliver packets with bread or stuff like that to people's rooms, leave them outside. They can take them as they go. If they do want full room service, they will get room service, but it'll be left on a trolley. They will call you and tell you the trolley is outside your room. You go, you take it in. It will be completely contactless. Okay, There's a question got by Bunny here. Okay, yeah. Why don't you take that? Um, Bunny, I think I've, that question I've lost. Uh, I think it's gone and scroll. Okay, I I. Uh, I think I think he uh, he is basic. Can you scroll it? I could. Uh, okay, food is not overrated as such. Sometimes it's the ambience which makes the difference in your taste and feel. What do you feel? Absolutely. I find it very hard to take people who claim that there's an objective criterion for food seriously. Every meal you have is a combination of different things. If you just had a fight with your wife, the chances are you're not going to enjoy the meal, no matter how good or bad it is. If it's served in really dirty surroundings and you're uneasy about the dogs and cats roaming around, no matter how tasty the food is, you're not going to like it. If the waiter is rude to you, you're not going to like it. Food is about your state of mind. There's an English chef called Eston Blumenthal. Um, Nitesh is gone, but we did this at his hotel. He was cooking at Nitesh's hotel. And after dinner, I did a question answer thing with Heston. And Heston, who's one of the world's greatest chefs, believes that food is about the pleasure center in the brain. So he, we had a glass, all of us had a glass of wine. So he said some nice things to try the wine, isn't it good? So he said, okay, now think of something really bad, something really sad and tragic that's happened in your life and try the wine. And I swear to God, the wine didn't taste this good. So food is only partly about the chef. It's partly about you and your state of mind. I've got a question from Bindu Bamba. Uh, what do you think of Claude Levi Stra Strauss uh, that, that the preparation of food is a form of language that reveals society's structure? The more complex society boils, the next level roast and the third smokes. Boiling involves many different mixing. Uh, I think I lost the question. Boiling involves many different mixings of different element eats. What is the umami in Indian food? The what in Indian food? Some you what's I think umami. I've lost the question. Is it umami? Oh, yes. Umami. Yes. I think I've lost yeah. the question. Okay. It's gone. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is very fr only a Frenchman and Lord Levi Strauss is of course Frenchman could say something like this. The French approach food in various kinds of detail. When you go to a French kitchen and they explain boiling, which is one of the examples there, they will tell you there are 12 different kinds of boiling. The French believe that food should be, or the preparation food should be as complex as possible. And they believe that the complexity of that preparation shows the sophistication of their society. I mean, I can see what he's getting at, but I think that's too French-centric a view of food. Food reflects society, yes, where it's possible to read too much into it. Okay. We've got a question from Chandni. Hospitality candidates were mostly headed to cruises. What happens now, given the industry has taken a big hit? That they don't do any cruises and they come back and cook in their own countries and learn how to cook proper food rather than rubbish and cruise ships. <laughs> Okay. Which Indian dessert do you think deserves a Michelin star or stars? That's by Abhilasha. This is a question for you. Which Indian well, dessert do you Michelin think? Michelin doesn't give stars to individual dishes, but if I had to pick my favorite dessert, it would be the jalebi. Oh, lovely. Okay. There's one question by Dipinder also. Uh, yes. You want to take that? No, I'll, I'll get. Veer, what is the most memorable meal you've ever had and why? Could you share with us what was the menu comprised of? No one meal, I have okay, to say. Nice. There are meals with some good dishes, some meals with bad dishes. No one meal is ever perfect. And there's this question by... I her think there's a question yeah. by Bhumika Batra. Why has the desi ghee receded to the to back to be re replaced by olive oil or canola oil? So why not desi ghee for everything? <laughs> because of doctors. Because there was a view spread in the 1950s that a saturated fat, 
and desi ghee is made from milk and milk is an animal product so desi ghee therefore is an animal product so there was a view spread in the 50s by doctors that butter and therefore i suppose by implication in india desi ghee were really bad for you that they clogged your veins they gave you high cholesterol that view has been completely debunked even the us government which spread the original recommendation against saturated fats now says that of your total blood cholesterol only about 15% can come from diet so this whole nonsense about cholesterol laden foods has been exploded everywhere else in the world but indian doctors still tell you have olive oil which allows these guys to sell this really sorry squishwan crap olive oil to raise their prices and make lots and lots of money <laughs> left to myself i'll have butter i'll have this thing lovely uh, there's a question cup, you can take the last couple of questions yeah. there, okay yeah. um, is self service to certain extent a new normal in hotels would the guests be fine with that uh, to a certain extent so this question is by my younger brother who runs a farm stay uh, you know very unique boutique farm stay in hosharpur itself yeah my view on this is no i don't think people are necessarily going to be okay with self service i can understand this whole business of contactless check in and contactless delivery to a certain extent but essentially what distinguishes anything whether it's a home stay or whether it's a deluxe hotel from the other is the warmth the quality of the warmth and the way in which you are treated and you cannot do that as self service place so hotels will have to find a way of keeping the warmth thank okay. you so we got last two questions very quick ones crisp ones uh first one is which gujarati dish do you recommend um do you have any gujarati favorites yeah but it's not a dish that you find much outside of gujarat it's a mixed vegetable dish called undia Okay. So I don't know if that's any help with the job, but that's my favorite dish. <laughs> and there's a question: um, um, Would you go with presentation or the taste when it comes to food? I hate presentation. I find people <laughs> who focus too much on presentation destroy Indian food. Taste is everything. So all fluff, no content is not your thing. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so in fact, I have a question, uh, Veer. That that yeah. do you think that we have started concentrating on flavors much more than taste in the sense that the biryani that you get is just I think rose water, you know, flavors and all that you get. Yeah, but I think generally the reason why home delivery will score over restaurants when they reopen is that home delivery has no potential for presentation. so the guys who do home delivery and some of them are very very good chefs have to focus on taste restaurants chefs are too obsessed with instagram and how many people will take pictures of their dish and will share it so they spend more time in trying to make the dish look good than in trying to make it taste right so the Thank last you. i read that delhi uh, home delivery if you if you want to order thai food they'll give you thai cutlery they'll have a fancy box that looks like a Uh, almost like a table mat um, and just to give you that experience of the restaurant that's the new thing coming up um, i don't know how you know how well that many hotel like chains are also trying to plan that that you can do say a dumplings banquet in your house and they'll send you as you say the cutlery the crockery let's see if it works all right i think i think we've had a great session and uh, we're just in time to wrap it up thank you veer uh, thank, thank you for inviting time. me i've had a wonderful time thank you kushwan that was amazing Thank you, Veer, Thank you. and we should get you to Hoshiarpur now for yes. for finally, for yeah. yeah, finally for your political uh, column. Yeah. I love that column Thanks. actually. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you. much. Thanks. Guys. Thank you. I'm going to end Bye. this meeting now. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Thank, you Thank, Thank you, friends. Thank you, friends. Thank you, everyone Bye. who's Bye. attended this. Yes. Thank you.